thank you all for, for being here for this digital discussion, China's ESG landscape outlook and insights. Um, we decided to put this together. Um, clearly, there's a lot of interest in our wider business network. Um, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, companies interested in how this particular uh, area is developing in China and, and, and around the world, of course. Um, and so there's an, there's an awful lot to discuss. Uh, we're very grateful um, that we have some great experts from our network to, to take part in today's discussion. Um, ESG in China and the landscape is very fast moving, both in terms of business trends um, and uh, regulation, new standards. Um, and that's also, again, uh, reflected uh, on the international level. Um, now, we have some great speakers today. Um, I'll, I'll bring them in very soon. But we want to hear from you as well. We want this to be an interactive discussion. Um, I'll just explain uh, very quickly sort of ground rules and how it's going to proceed. So we are on the record. Uh, you'll have seen we are recording this. Um, that's so we can capture as much from the discussion as possible. Um, we're going to hear from our expert speakers first, and, th and then I'll open it up uh, to the wider uh, participants for discussion, questions, comments. Um, uh, we, are, uh, we currently have uh, quite a few guests joining. Um, we, have, we have over 60 guests at the moment, and uh, we, we may have more join as we get, get on with the discussion. Um, so um, if when we get on to the discussion part, um, if you do want to ask a question, get involved, I really do encourage that. Uh, you can indicate that in the chat box, or you can raise your hand, do the virtual hand raise on Zoom. Um, and then I will try and bring in as many people as possible um, to do that. Um, it'd be great if you keep your camera on, if you're comfortable with that, then you know it helps, I think, with the, uh, with, with the engagement and the discussion. Um, uh, unless I'm bringing you in, if you could stay on mute, I think that would also help um uh, uh to avoid any distractions there um now at any point please feel free to put comments questions and observations in the chat box um uh uh my colleagues will be monitoring that and i, I will maybe bring some of some of you in for, for those questions but feel free to to put your observations there um i have a colleague johnny smith uh johnny can introduce himself in the chat box there and he's going to put his email address there as well. Johnny may put a few questions in or, or, or prompt uh, some, some discussion there. And Johnny can also help to follow up uh, later on uh, uh, after, the, after the discussion on anything that people want to follow up with. So uh, hopefully we'll have a lively discussion and hopefully we will um, we'll get, uh, share some, some really useful insights. Right, I'm going to get on with the, with the discussion. Uh, now, first of all, I want to uh, turn to our first guest, uh, Jure, Professor Jure, or Juliet, uh, Juliet from CKGSB. Juliet um, is a professor of marketing there and has done an awful lot of work on uh, sustainable business, ESG, and, and business for, for good in China. Uh, Juliet's based in Shanghai. Um, so, Juliet, um, perhaps you, you've done a lot of work dealing with companies, uh, business owners, individuals who've been in and out of CKGSB, uh, you know, in China's leading international business school. What are the trends that you're seeing uh, in China with, with adoption of ESG reporting and standards? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you, Charlie. And hello, everyone. Um, great honor to be here. I'm Juliet, uh, and I'm teaching social innovation and business for good uh, in CKGSB here in China. I'm currently in Shanghai. Um, it's an interesting topic when we talk about how ESG perceptions has changed or evolved over time, particularly in China. And what we have been observing from these entrepreneurs, these business people in terms of adapting these ideas into their practices. So I want to share with you some of my insights. Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, just the perception of the ESG idea. I came back in 2013. Uh, so I was away for 15 years um, studying and working in North America. And I came back in 2013 I started really paying attention and doing research teaching on the topic of business for good and social innovation centering around the idea of ESG in 2016. And so today is 2022. I can tell from my first person experience when I started teaching in 2016, that concept was very rarely known among my Chinese audience. They have never barely heard of the term ESG. Uh, social responsibility was very common at that time. Um, and also when I was talking about how to incorporate ESG ideas into their business practice at that time, it was, um, you know, it was sort of like, okay, let me 
make big first. Let me make money first, and then I can take care of these issues. Uh, but over the years till now, um, six years have passed since I started teaching this course. I really see the change. I'm sorry. I really see the change in terms of how much people are paying attention, not just to be aware of these concepts, but are more willing to um, understand more and try to think about what they can do to really incorporate these core ideas into their daily business practice. So it's not just a sort of add on thing when I have enough money or profit, but more so in terms of how can I actually carry out on a day to day business. So one thing. So that's one perception that I've been observing, and especially in the past two or three years when the pandemic um, is sort of like really just a, you know, a overcoming everything else is making the whole world different. And particularly now I'm in Shanghai, you know, it's, it's very, um, you know, uh, unpleasant situation. Uh, but during these crisis times, I actually see a greater call and a greater um, demand from the public, from the consumer, asking companies to um, pay more attention to be responsible to adopting these ESG principles. So those are some of the observation, observations that I've been um, uh, seeing. And in order to really, um, from business school perspective, in order to um, help facilitate this idea, promote this idea among our business entrepreneurs, and we have been doing uh, some very innovative course in CKGSB. Uh, particularly, we started a social innovation and business for good practice-based course started yes, uh, last year. And so for all our EMBA students, these are part-time students, they have their own company. Most of the majority of them are owners of these companies. They are uh, CEOs or um, uh, the top officials of their company. They took this course, and uh, not just the two-day theoretically based course, but they had to carry out, design and carry out a one-year-long business for good project. And so what I mean by that is they had to think about in which way, E, S, or G, in which way they can actually improve their daily business practice and trying to solve social problems while in the long run achieve better economic returns. So they had to do this one year project and we do this on a day on an individual basis. And then uh, uh, we also set up a mentor program to help students um, carry out these projects. And so far we have seen some really amazing results from this practice based course. Um, and I think from a business school perspective, it's truly uh, innovation in terms of teaching education and also sort of uh, implementing these ideas into practice. And one last thing I sort of want to mention, uh, which stems out of this course, this innovative course, is the kind of research that I and my colleagues are doing in terms of promoting uh, initiatives or guidelines um, centering around the ESG principle, but more suited for China context. So for example, there are a lot of these guidelines, standards around the world, um, you know, what criterions you have to meet, but some of them um, don't quite fit into the Chinese context because they are uh, more Western based, they are not quite suited for our situation. So what we have been doing is to develop for each industry in China, these business for good initiatives that helps business people in China in these different industries to really become more sustainable. So the first two industries that we're developing these in initiatives are for the gaming industry, the online gaming industry, which is extremely profitable, but also very debatable. And so we try to set up these guidelines, you know, what you can do to help a main um, long-term healthy development. And the second industry we're doing is in the food and dining industry. And this is the lines of research that we are doing to promote this idea in uh, CKGSB. So I'll just stop here um, and I'll talk more later. Sure, thank you so much, Juliet. I think one thing you touched on there, which we'll definitely come back to is the, you know, the, the China specific aspect and, and, and differences in you know, environmental social governance, perhaps approach in China and in uh, other jurisdictions or on a global level. But I want to come to uh, Wang Xitong, uh, who we know as Adib. Um, we first knew uh, Adib in the Middle East where he was based for many years, so we know him by his Arabic name. 
uh, what, uh, Adib is um, head of ESG affairs and, and senior associate at the Everbright Belt and Road Green Fund, um, very much coming from a, a sort of pers uh, uh, investment perspective. Um, Adib, what are, from an investor's perspective, how do you see the market, um, and what are the what are the the trends there among companies that you might look at, um, uh, and, and investment opportunities that you might look at in China? Thank you, Charlie. I'm uh, Adib uh, from Everbright Green Fund. It's my honor to be here. And uh, as a private equity fund, Green is one of our, one of our investment themes. First, our investment fields are green. We aim to find good Chinese companies in green sectors and support their products, services to go abroad and pro promote local green development. Second, our investment method is green. And uh, we are among the first Chinese PE funds to fully implement uh, ESG standards in the investment process. And uh, from our view, ESG represents the philosophy of value investing. There's a misunderstanding that ESG means to sacrifice return for corporate responsibilities or for public goods. And we think it's not correct. On the contrary, ESG can help companies to have financial benefits and achieve sustainable development at the same time. It may be a little difficult to understand why there can be financial benefits, so I want to explain a bit. Uh, the first benefit is ESG helps companies to obtain excess returns and reduce downside risks. In secondary markets, a large number of studies have proved that there is a positive correlation between ESG performance and stock price. In China's market, according to CSI index, from July 2017 to last month, uh, the cumulative returns of the CSI 500 ESG benchmark index were 8.1% higher than the parent index. In particular, during the downturn of global capital markets since the beginning of this year, uh, CSI 500 ESG benchmark index is more protected from downside pressure than parent index. Other than that, ESG high related, uh, high rated uh, companies have higher levels of dividend yield, demonstrating more sustainable profitability uh, as well as stronger willingness to pay dividends. While in primary market, we have seen more and more investors are willing to pay higher price for ESG premium, especially when we are talking about more about dual carbon strategy in China in recent years. Big companies begin to care about more on whether their target projects or companies are performing well in ESG or do they have a green supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. The second benefit is ESG helps unlisted companies access capital markets more easily. We see the requirements from ESG as the most important external driver of ESG development. According to a sustainable stock exchange initiative, 30 markets have required ESG reporting as a listing rule. In China, uh, in China, from July of 2020, Hong Kong Exchange required all listed companies to disclose ESG reports and also required IPO applicants to additionally disclose ESG information, which means exchange, stock exchange requirements for ESG information disclosure is shifting from post IPO to pre IPO. In mainland China, uh, last month, China Securities Regulatory Commission issued guidelines for a listed company to include ESG in the communication content of investor relations for the first time. And not only in China, SEC recently published a proposed rule that would expand and enhance uh, disclose, uh, disclosure requirements of ESG and climate related risks to all the public companies. So wherever a company wants to become listed, it is better to incorporate ESG into its governance system as early as possible to save its compliance cost. The third financial benefit is ESG helps companies to obtain lower financing costs. In the case of uh, systemic risks brought about by the pandemic, company, companies with good ESG performance demonstrate higher risk and resistance. An important reason is that these companies are more likely to gain the trust of investors and stakeholders such as government departments, consumers, and employees. And they are able to withstand trust crisis when the market faces negative shocks. And the financial institutions are therefore more willing to provide 
financing to companies with better social and governance performance. In 2020, China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission issued a, guide, a guidance which requires banking and financial institutions to incorporate ESG requirements into the entire credit granting process. So these are the three major financial financial benefits from ESG investment. investment. Investors should not only realize the benefits themselves, but also need to build a consensus about ESG with invested companies to smooth the future cooperation. And that's it. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Adib. That's great. Um, uh, definitely a, a number of things that we may come back to, um, but I think what you're saying about the preparing for uh, and then the trust and preparing for listing those two things are, are very interesting we may come on to that um i want to uh i want to move now to our uh, our next guest uh, michelle cameron is part of refinitive which is part of the london stock exchange group uh michelle leads uh, work with clients across asia on on data and uh, for easy refinitive being one of the biggest um uh, data providers in the world um, data is essential for underpinning uh, all of this because if we're going to understand the impact, the environmental, social governance impact, we need to be able to measure it. So, um, Michelle, I'm very interested to hear from you. What are what are companies doing, and what what are the challenges and opportunities um, associated with with uh, acquiring data, producing data, managing data to to get the results in ESG that's required? Thanks, Charlie, um, and nicely leading on from Adeep's point there as well. So, um, so we work with clients both on the sustainable investing side of the financial markets and also on the um, sustainable finance side as well, so the banks and the like. Um, so we see ourselves as quite an enabler, um, supporting that shift of, of capital to sustainable outcomes. Um, and, and we believe the role of data and disclosures is critical to successfully embedding sustainability across the financial ecosystem. So I wanted to touch on three things very quickly. So first of all, ESG and the importance of data, um, and then the role of the policymaker um, and regulators, and then supporting the transition um, to a, a lower carbon economy. So on the ESG data side, so we're seeing um, specifically in the context of China that, that companies are reporting on their ESG considerations much more than they ever have done, and that's clearly a trend that we're seeing across the globe. Um, in the last reporting cycle that we ran, we saw around 85% of the CSI 300, um, so the larger market cap companies um, reporting completely on their ESG performance. Um, but we're still some way off having the entire picture as we really need companies um, across um, all sizes, not just listed companies, so private companies um, also to disclose. Um, but not only do we need to see the quantity of data, but also the quality of the data needs to be really high. So we're currently seeing that a lot of the reports that we're um, analysing and, and extrapolating information from are, are incomplete or they can be quite qualitative in nature. Um, so that really evidences the need for much more prescriptive guidelines around reporting expectations so that investors have real confidence in the integrity um, and credibility of the data. So I think the ESG reporting rate and trajectory in China and globally is absolutely trending in the right direction, but we're still some way off um, being complete. Um, and then onto the second point around linking that back to the importance of, um, of the, the roles of policymakers and regulators um, and, and, and their role in kind of driving, accelerating the adoption rate. So in order to really accelerate that shift of capital, um, governments, policymakers, regulators, they all play an essential role um, and have a great responsibility around that capital reallocation. So we see that regulators globally are certainly indicating intent, but if we're really going to see a shift of the magnitude required um, to achieve targets that have been set out, then, then we really are um, expecting we're moving from voluntary to mandatory reporting. So the writing's very much on the wall for this, and in some cases we're seeing this happen. So a really good example at the moment is the mandatory introduction of the climate related um, disclosures, so the TCFD um, that is being mandated in some countries. So that's a good example where we're seeing that move um, and that acceleration. Um, so we recently actually published a paper on this topic around disclosure rates and recommendations. And essentially what, what we're saying is that we can't afford to wait for international disclosures. Countries need to start mandating their own domestic 
disclosure targets um, in lieu of those global standards like the um, IFRS, um, ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which are expected um, to come out and draft later in the year. So one really um, exciting development is um, on, the, on the China landscape is the Enterprise Forum in China have done precisely this with their recent declaration around um, ESG disclosure standards. So we're really pleased to see more and more of these mandates coming out. Um, and we need to harness that power and, and collective size of the capital markets to improve um, outcomes. And, and policymakers, regulators have a really key role to play in that. And then just on the transition side, so this is a real driver and it's a real central um, component of um, our focus at the moment around global decarbonisation plans. Um, so for China, you've uh, kind of um, published the dual carbon targets that were laid out. So 2030 for peaking emissions, 2060 for carbon neutrality. Um, and they've really helped to focus and accelerate the development of, um, of green and sustainable finance projects, especially. So on the fixed income side of the market, we're seeing a really big increase in the issuance in China across um, kind of green, social, sustainable linked bonds. Um, so green loans were up nearly 30% year on year. Um, and, and as of the end of last year, cumulative issuance of global green bonds exceeded 1.6 trillion RMB. And this continues to rise. So um, just to put that number in perspective, um, according to the CICC, um, China is estimated to need roughly $21.3 trillion of debt financing to meet net zero emissions target. So clearly some way to go, um, but I think one of the focus areas that that um, that we're seeing out of China as well is the um, the need to continue enticing foreign investment and harnessing the power of the scale. And as we talk about transition planning, carbon intensive industries, so extractives like oil and gas and coal, they're going to find it harder and harder to operate as lenders won't want to do business with them if they don't continue to focus and improve their um, their, their transition planning. Um, so I think in in summary, we're seeing some really strong indications of intent. We're starting to see that capital flowing much more consistently into sustainable outcomes. And as we get closer to global reporting standards and the local government in China mandating ESG reporting in lieu of those global mandates, we're going to really see a, a big surge in, in disclosures. And whether it's enough to meet targets, it's likely a little bit premature. But for the next six to 12 months, um, that will give us a really strong indication um, on how we're tracking against the, uh, the current trajectory. Um, I think at the moment, China are currently sat at around um, 3.2 degrees warming under the current plans. So some way to get to, to go down to 1.5 with the disclosures and regulations. Um, but um, I think we're certainly seeing those commitments um, now taking shape um, and starting to see it really hit the, um, uh, you know, hit the bottom line. So very exciting time to be watching the space. Thanks, Michelle. That's great. Um, now I'm going to um, turn to our next speaker in just a minute. Just a quick reminder. Um, if you want to ask a question, I'm going to open up to questions shortly. If you want to ask a question, put your hand up or, or put something in the chat box and feel free to put any observations um, there as well. Uh, now, I just want to turn to um, my colleague Phyllis Papa David. Phyllis leads Asia House Research. She's a fantastic economist. Um, we've done a number of things recently on um, uh, green finance and sustainable investment uh, in China and other Asian countries. Um, Phyllis, it'd be great to get your sense of the sort of macro view. Take a step back, and and uh, we heard about some of the uh, from Adib some of the. Uh, challenges, economic challenges. Um, obviously, we have a lot of economic challenges in in in, in the global economy following COVID um, and various other aspects. Do you, do you want to give us a sense as how you see things in China and what the, the challenges and opportunities are uh, for ESG around um, around the economic uh, macroeconomics? Sure. Thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, we monitor economic readiness uh, at Asia House. We regularly update our economic readiness indices for the ability of countries to channel green finance. China actually tops the list of the eight countries we follow, although financial stability and some of the risks that have been materializing of late have meant that its readings have sort of slipped. And in my comments, I will focus on some of these bigger macroeconomic risks. Um, that are materializing in China. The first, as everyone knows, is the macroeconomic slowdown in China, which is becoming more uh, entrenched. 
And the push for sustainability really comes at a time of heightened geopolitical and macroeconomic risk. And the nature of the slowdown means that persistent weakness in certain sectors of the economy um, will take precedence over the push for, for sustainability. So number one, we have the, the macroeconomic slowdown. At number two, the second risk that we are monitoring at, at Asia House quite closely is the fact, well, it's not really, it's the link. Sustainability is intimately linked with economic transformation. Uh, and it really requires the policy capacity to re redistribute resources to become more sustainable. And the risk is that if we see continued volatility in the energy markets, that policymakers, not only in China, but particularly in China and some other of the emerging markets, will focus more towards energy security and stability in cushioning the economic slowdown rather than prioritizing and sort of uh, mobilizing the transformation to uh, more sustainable practices. So policymakers really will be in firefighting mode uh, rather than this push towards the adoption of sustainable practices. The last, the third risk that I want to highlight is on regulations and investment climate. So this really touches on Adib's point um, on the ecosystem in China for channeling investments. So regulations can impact the liquidity in certain assets, particularly at a time of heightened risk aversion. And we are currently in a period, if not heightened risk aversion, but persistent risk aversion in financial markets, both in equity markets and now increasingly in credit markets. And we know that China does have, um, again, em emerging markets in general have this in certain spots, but China has a debt problem. And so I would emphasize that the combination of the lower liquidity and risk aversion in financial markets might prove tricky uh, for China's non-financial corporate sector um, when we're talking about transformation into more uh, sustainable practices. So it's something worth keeping an eye on and something that we're watching in terms of a key risk. Those are my three macroeconomic themes that I touch on. I'll leave it there. Sure, sure. And we'll come, come back to that um, in the discussion now. Um, I'll come, I'll bring in, um, we've got some questions there from the audience. I'm gonna to come to that um, shortly. Um, I just want to uh, cover a couple of things that, that were in, in the comments. Um, um, it'd be very interesting to hear from, uh, each of the speakers, what the, the biggest challenges from their perspective as they see it to, to developing uh, sort of an ESG framework in China. And I appreciate that that may be also somewhat dependent on a broader global framework coming about. Um, uh, maybe start with Adib. Um, from an investor's perspective, how do companies react uh, when you are talking to them uh, with regard to embedding uh, environmental social governance standards in in their practice um, with regard to say um, you know acquiring investment in their in their companies uh, well i i would say uh, data is one of the biggest uh, challenges or obstacles like like michelle just mentioned um, uh, this is very interesting to know that secondary market is always more active in ESG investment, given its products are uh, uh, more uh, standardized and the data availability is at, at least better than in primary market. So you can find plenty of choices of ESG, uh, mutual funds, ETF, or stock e indexes. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so uh, secondary market has built a very a rel a rel relatively mature system for ESG inv investment. But if you are an investor for a primary market, then you want to invest in private companies, uh, uh, startups, infrastructure projects, you will find significant differences and uh, uh, difficulties coming from 
uh, data availability. Uh, for example, um, uh, ESG in primary market may face some uh, uh, difficulties like data availability, disclosure, winningness, etc. And the ESG practices in primary market is far less than secondary market, and we are keeping keeping exploring uh, replicate a way to do it. And but at the same time, you can do more at the primary market investment. Uh, you can participate deeply in corporate governance of your portfolio of your invested companies, which means you can do more at the post investment stage to help these companies to improve their ESG performance. So, so uh, these are the differences between primary and the secondary markets in China uh, of uh, ESG investment in China. And uh, also uh, you can see the difficulties of EFS, ESG investment here is the data availability. And of course, there is a lack of um, globally accepted standard is uh, another problem. Um, so from, for an a investor, uh, you, cannot, you cannot get uh, long-term reliable and uh, 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 data from uh, ESG agencies if there's an, there's an you not unified ESG standard. So maybe for a target company, you can get a, a ESG scores from the rating agencies from like 60 to 100. So you never know which one is more reliable and uh, you never know which one you can, you can trust. This is another problem. Sure, okay. Um, Michelle, I'll come to you in a minute. Um, we just had a lot about data there. I just want to turn to, Jure, to Juliet quickly. Um, uh, does your conversations, uh, in terms of sort of the challenge to embed ESG within companies, do, do, do your conversations with companies uh, match uh, what Adib is saying there? So, I mean, the, the, two, the two things, one, one is around data, and I'm sure Michelle can give us a bit more on that, but also on um, the, the sort of not, not understanding the standards or not being able to trust information that comes through. It's a highly complex set of you know, um, relationships often with suppliers and e everything that is involved in different industries in China, as in every country. W what are you hearing in terms of those challenges? Oh, I think you're on mute, Juliet. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Well, first of all, Charlie, um, you pronounced my Chinese name really well. So um, thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, uh, to your question, um, I think there are two issues. One is, I think ESG is a very broadly defined term. Um, ESG was originally uh, brought up um, as a way to really encourage investors um, to look into these dimensions when they think about which target to invest. But from a company's perspective, from a corporation's perspective, they need to think about which aspect, which specific aspects of ESG they need to pay attention to and really put effort in resources in and so that they can not only just resolve or solve these issues or you know, solve these social problems or environmental problems, but also in a more sustainable way in a sense that they can make money out of doing this. If they are all doing these good things, but in the end, they turn out to be hugely costly and they're all dying, nobody is gonna willing to do this. So I think that's why the right dimensions for people to pay attention to, to really guide these companies in different industries, to think about which dimensions, which initiatives you should really focus on is crucially important. So when I first started teaching this in China, I used these Western standards. For example, the specific one that I used is SASB. Uh, so SASB, I don't know if everybody is familiar with that. That's the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And they basically um, classified these 11 big industries and into 77 um, smaller uh, industries. And so within each industry, they list these material issues. These are the issues that companies within different industries need to focus on. And so that these are material issues. So you can focus your resources on these issues to ensure your maximum return. So I brought those standards into China, into my classroom. I translated them. I explained them carefully to my students. But guess what? 
our students, these are the business owners, these are the entrepreneurs. Um, they look at these standards, they say, well, they don't really fit us. They are very westernized. Some of the dimensions that just don't fit into our situation. If we focus on those issues, it may not work. It will be purely costly at this point, not reaching a balance between what I put in and what I can get out. So let me give you one specific industry, uh, for example. As I mentioned earlier, I was studying um, the gaming, computer gaming industry, um, simply because it's, it's very hot these days. It's popular and very profitable, but also has a lot of issues. And so in the SASB standard, that fall into the internet media and service industry. So if you look at that standard, and um, they basically ask you to pay attention to the following issues, such as consumer data, uh, consumer privacy, data privacy, energy management, employee engagement, et cetera. And so if you look at these um, Western, um, I would say Western gaming companies. So for example, when I look at um, you know, when I look at EA, when I look at Nintendo, when I look at uh, Blizzard, um, I don't know if you guys play games, um, so I had to play because I'm doing this research. If you look at their EST report, they strictly focus on these issues, which is fine and which fits into their um, development stage. And they also cover other issues such as, um, you know, inclusiveness, whether our characters should include um, you know, um, LGBTQ um, category, whether we should have all accessibility, um, these issues. But those issues are not the target or focal issues that are paid attention to or deserve that much attention among the Chinese computer game um, companies, because we're just not at that stage yet. But instead, when I put together our leading companies in the gaming industry in China, and what they are telling me are the following issues that are not covered in SASB. For example, the very first one is um, adolescence um, addiction protection. That's a huge issue in China, um, probably also around the world. But in China, the government pays very much attention to how computer game companies are making our kids very addicted to these games. And you need to do something. Otherwise, you are in big trouble. So that's listed as number one issue. Every company, they are saying we need to pay attention to. So how can we do this? How can we balance you know, time? We try to appeal our kids to play on these games while at the same time following these guidelines the government is setting up and maintaining our company's development. And then there are also other issues such as how to um, make our um, sort of culture and these uh, culture ideas or um, Chinese cultures, they are better incorporated in these games so that they can provide educational tool for our kids and also sort of a way to spread our culture um, outside our uh, border. And there are other issues such as how can you use the technologies or the advanced um, technology in the gaming industry to help other industries, for example, like medical care. How can you use games to help people with ADHD to recover? And these are some of the issues our Chinese gaming companies are paying attention to. And so that's the reason behind my research, why we want to develop these business for good initiatives specifically for industries in China, um, just to fit the current development stage. Uh, some industries, they're developing really fast, uh, probably faster than other parts of the world. And some other industries, they are a bit behind. So um, that's yeah. the reason why we adapt different standards. Okay, it's so yeah. fascinating. At least I think that's necessary. Yeah, so clearly clearly there are there are market-specific elements, especially in the S of the ESG. Um, Michelle, I'll come, yeah. come back to you. Um, is, there, is there room, when you're looking at... Um, quantifying a more quantified um, way of, of understanding the ESG impact. Is there room for different regimes? Can data sets and data formats, if you like, be flexible to that? And what do you, you know, how, how, how do you see those challenges to help companies sort of meet their, their aspirations in those areas? Yeah, so I think this is this is a massive challenge globally at the moment. So I think um, I completely agree with um, Adeep's points um, just around you know the the data um, 
comparability, the, the integration capabilities, alignment globally. So we're seeing um, that, that obviously the, the push towards mandating reporting in lieu of those domestic, um, you know, in, in lieu of the domestic disclosures, which are closely tied to the upcoming global mandates, that they, they are becoming increasingly kind of difficult um, and more complex. So we recognize that there is different weightings that need to be applied across different sectors, depending on which parts um, of the EDS or the G they have more exposure to. Um, but that there, you know, we're one provider. Um, we collect data in a consistent way across our data model. Um, the, the challenge that we have is that across the, um, you know, across other data providers, other ratings agencies, there's differences in how that is collected and how that is presented. Um, so I think having this, this push towards the global framework absolutely is required, but that doesn't mean it's going to be um, easy and, and free from issues. We have, so um, Julia mentioned the SASB, um, you've got the EU taxonomy. Within the Asia Pacific region, we're much more fragmented. So it makes it even more complicated for us to have those frameworks that apply across the board. So um, I think in answer to your question, there isn't an easy way to solve for this, but we need to get to a point where we can run um, and compare data um, across the globe. Um, and, and have and look at the, the differences between the industries um, in the different jurisdictions to make sure that the whichever framework we come up with um, is uh, is able to be flexible enough to to reflect correctly um, you know where there are potential exposures so a really really challenging issue at the moment but we're certainly seeing that we're, we're getting um, we're getting closer to where we need to be great um thanks michelle and then phyllis just very quickly um before i bring in uh, some of our some of our um guests um to the discussion you you characterized from a macroeconomic perspective the challenge between um dealing with economic slowdown sort of versus the uh, focus that could go into sustainability are they mutually exclusive i appreciate in the short term there's obviously you know additional costs on a microeconomic basis um associated for, for companies looking to improve their their esg ratings and 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 improve their footprint um in environment social and governance um but is there a long-term uh way to, to to look at that that the improvement in those areas can actually help the underlying economic performance uh in china or, or any other country for that matter Sure, they're not mutually exclusive, of course, as uh, Deep was saying, and others have said that the push for sustainability actually is a driving factor behind growth in certain economies and certain sectors. But the key um, distinguishing factor is the issue of, of uh, finance. So if you are talking about a sector where there is perhaps some extra risks or some over indebtedness, um, that constellation of risks may mean that the adoption of sustainable practices or the development of ESG uh, is, is uh, at risk or more challenging. So from a, a macroeconomic perspective, it's certainly not mutually exclusive, but there are certain sectors which we need to be mindful of. Sure. Okay, great. Um, now, really want to bring in um, audience members. Uh, I know there was a, a few questions there lined up. Um, Matt Chan uh, from JP Morgan, I believe you had a, a question you wanted to present. Thank you. Um, I suppose just a, an observation with a little bit of a question and then a question um, very quickly. I mean, I, I, I get the sense sometimes that um, sometimes China gets a little bit of a bad rap in terms of its green credentials. I think sometimes people forget the role that China played in terms of um, uh, even the Paris Agreement back in 2016, getting that on track, agreements with the US. Um, the fact that um, China and the US are, are leading the sustainable finance working group. Um, it's China and the EU working on taxonomy issues. Um, obviously, the, the commitments around ecological civilization, etc. So, be interested in, in, in the panel's thoughts on that. And then, my I guess my other question, and we've started to touch upon it, um, was just around the social factors. Um, I think even in the more developed uh, markets, S 
uh, factors can be very difficult to quantify, very difficult to um, compare. I think Michelle has touched on that. Um, often it's not structured, it's narrative, it's not uh, based on targets. So my question there would be from a China perspective, whether, um, you know, what are the opportunities for improvement? But on the flip side, are there things, and maybe uh, Roy, Ju, you, you touched on that, are there things that we can learn from China in terms of how it deals with, with S factors that we can apply more internationally? I'm going to divide these up to individual panelists so we can get through as many as, as possible. Um, Adib, do you want to just take the first question, um, which is really about China's uh, desire to drive on a global level um, sustainability, particularly around environment? How, how do you see, uh, do, do you think China may end up leading on uh, uh, ESG uh, requirements uh, from a regulatory perspective? because um, China has already started to introduce quite a few regulations and, and talking about that, whereas some many countries, it's still very much on, on a voluntary basis. Um, how do you see China's sort of uh, role in that? Well, I have to say this is a very big topic and uh, I want to focus uh, on the ESG side and uh, try to answer it from ESG investment. And uh, uh, I, I think the, uh, ESG, uh, when it comes to the uh, global market, it means it needs uh, collaboration between countries. Uh, in recent years, we have seen the collaboration uh, between China and the EU on the uh, standard of uh, uh, green finance. And of, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, work has been, ha have been done. Uh, I have to say that ESG is uh, more difficult given the, uh, you, you have a uh, quantitative indicators and uh, qualitative indicators, and uh, it is uh, di more difficult to harmonize the standards, but uh, I think uh, it is uh, something you need to do. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we, we, can, we can see something in the future. Great. And then um, on the social factors, um, Jure, do you want to just quickly tackle that, that part of Matt's question? Yeah, um, great question, uh, Matt, first of all. Mm, I want to, um, all I can say is from my personal experience, um, what I've learned in terms of overcoming the challenges of teaching this course and really making students, these are, um, these are top of the pyramid entrepreneurs or EMBA students to get them really pay attention to ESG and do this. My very first try in teaching this course, I was telling them that this is a good thing you should pay attention to ESG and really try to incorporate these into your business. My very first term was a disaster. Uh, well, not, not so bad. I mean, the rating was okay, but uh, I know it was a disaster in the sense that the students weren't really um, getting the message. They feel like, you know, you're just from the Ivy Tower um, doing academic research. How do you know the competitiveness, the challenge of running business? If we pay attention to these issues, we won't survive. We won't make money tomorrow. Our company will die. So my idea didn't come across. So later on, I had to think carefully. I had to really get down or not, I mean, get close to my students and try to think about what language I can say to really click with them. So eventually I realized that incorporating ESG, I have to position it in a way, which I think it should be, positioned in a way that this is the mean to achieve a great goal. And the goal is to be more profitable. The goal is to back to business um, bottom line, to make more money, to be more sustainable. But what's the best way to be more sustainable? What's the best way to be more profitable is to focus on these issues focus on these social issues, these environmental issues. And so there are so many issues which want to focus on, let me help you to find these material issues and particularly to fit your status, your stage today. That's why we're developing these standards for um, China situation today. So when I speak that language, I started to see really a big change in terms of how students perceive this course. They don't see it just as a course per se, and they actually try to design projects and implement it into their company's practice. So we made this into a year long project. This is not superficial. It's a year long project. They submit their initial report, their midterm report and their final results. And so I'm observing these um, you know, 
daily ongoing activities based on these companies' actual practice. So the outcomes I'm seeing are the following two. One is I'm seeing more and more students, and these are entrepreneurs, they are actually embedding true relevant ESG uh, items into their daily business practice, their strategy, their business development, their resource allocation. So I'm seeing that. And number two, as a result of that, you know, they started to feel I'm doing more respectful things than before. Their employees, their partners are perceiving them as more as, you know, entrepreneurs or not just a businessman, but entrepreneurs with these, you know, a big heart and really a great aspirations. So they feel good about that. And that, that good feeling also pushes them to do more. So I think it's really what, what, what other people can learn from our experience or not just uh, you know, in China, but other parts of the world. I think from educators perspective or from other people's perspective, just to try to understand their true issue, stand from their perspective. They need to survive. They need to make money. They need to grow and that's legitimate. And we need to make sure we offer them a way so that they can grow better. And all I'm saying is to pay attention to these issues is actually your best way to be successful. Great, okay, I'm gonna take another question. Uh, Matt Jackson, KPMG. Thanks, Charlie. Um, firstly, a big thank you to Asia House and all panelists um, for putting this on today. I think we all realize this is a much uh, longer conversation and um, no doubt there'll be other, other sort of dialogue to follow. But um, I think it's a really important topic, not just ESG, which we know to be the sort of front and center of many conversations, but ESG with Chinese characteristics. Um, and you know, we must recognize and respect the nuances of the, uh, the Chinese system and, and culture. Um, my question, if I may, is directed primarily at um, uh, Adi, Mr. Wang, again, um, as uh, the sort of ESG lead on a, a Green Belt and Road Fund. Now, um, pre-pandemic, our organization and uh, a few others uh, within the Asia House membership um, were speaking with third market governments on structuring uh, projects, infrastructure projects for, for private, private capital investment under the sort of BRI banner. Um, so, Adib, I'm just wondering, you know, with, with the sort of onset of your, uh, your fund and, um, and its reporting requirements around what we now know to be ESG, um, how, how do we see the, the, the sort of Chinese EPC contractors, the host market governments, you know, structuring their projects in such a way that private capital investment, you know, which, you know, can be crowded from the UK by the UK, into these Belt and Road projects? Well, I happen to uh, th uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, this is a good question. Uh, I, uh, I happen to uh, worked for a big Chinese uh, EPC before, uh, before uh, about five or six years ago. And uh, uh, in recent years, we also have seen that uh, the regulators have encouraged Chinese EPCs, uh, Chinese companies to uh, promote ESG in their projects in the overseas market. And uh, uh, I, I think this is a very uh, important thing. And this is a not a new thing. Uh, before uh, we talk about, we're talking about ESG, we, we, we've already talking about to respect the, the local customers uh, of the uh, local projects and uh, to, uh, create jobs for the local neighborhood. We, we're already talking about that. And uh, I would say ESG on the Belt and Road, the ESG in the overseas market uh, is another version, but uh, we're passing uh, the, the same spirit rate. And, uh, and uh, luckily, I think the Chinese EPC companies has begun to realize the importance of ESG, especially the climate uh, they uh, have to, uh, uh, to to care about uh, the climate change and uh, to uh, uh, protect the environment of the projects. And uh, we've seen such a trend in the Chinese EPC projects. 
Okay, I'm going to move on and we'll distribute questions to, to other um, panelists as we go. Um, Jing Lee from Standard Chartered, and you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Um, and um, I guess my question is really on the kind of common language and the comparability. So I think a few panelists touched on already. Um, so I guess um, we we all kind of aware the EU and China is currently discussing the common taxonomy. The work come out from the COP26 last year. So it, it feels like very high level announcement, really um, a milestone on what potentially can be uh, bring a lot of changes to this common language. I'm just wondering from your perspective, do you see this as a game changer? And uh, what, what does it mean actually for financial service companies in terms of the some of the challenges as well as the opportunities, uh, what, what that means? Let's, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, um, Michelle, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so completely um, agree that uh, obviously with the uh, looming global taxonomies, there will be, it is, it is a game changer. There's going to be some um, really exciting opportunities to really be able to confidently compare data globally, which is quite exciting. Um, but obviously, if you are, um, if you are uh, looking at how you're going to disclose yourself, then there's some challenges that come with that as well. So, you know, you, you really need to be across all of the different requirements. Um, and if you're a smaller company, it's going to be more challenging um, to be able to meet all of the uh, requirements that are going to be coming up with the uh, with that consistent standardization. So I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges. Um, but I think it's more of an opportunity than a challenge for the financial sector generally. Um, that we'll be able to really start seeing the uh, the, the weight of that change um, and the collaboration that can come off the back of it. Thanks. Um, is there anyone else that wants to deal with that one? Because that one that one is quite, I think, universal. Um, I don't know if Adib, you've got anything to say on those those the differences in terms of you know all the different regimes. Well, I, I think uh, um, lack of a globally accepted standard is a problem or is uh, uh, obstacles, not for ESG, but also for green finance. And so to have a unified one uh, means a lot. And uh, uh, again, and uh, as I just mentioned, for, for example, I mean, we have seen a lot of ESG or green finance rating agencies in the market, but uh, basically each of them has their own set of ESG indicators or green finance indicators and their own approaches to give ESG or, or, or uh, ESG scores and uh, to give scores of green finance. I think uh, this is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a mess, it's a problem. And uh, also for the financial services companies, uh, for the consultancy companies and uh, because uh, the companies cannot give the uh, comparable uh, information to the customers. And uh, I think under a uh, unified uh, standard for ESG or for green finance uh, is uh, uh, important and not, not only for the investors, invested companies, past, but also for the consultancy firms. That's my view. Okay, thanks. Um, well, look, unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. Um, it was great to get some questions in. Thank you so much for those. Um, as as uh, Matt said, it's a it's an expansive topic. I think we've heard from the different aspects of of it, or heard on the different aspects of ESG um, from from our speakers. I want to thank our speakers enormously. Um, um, Adib, who's in who's in Beijing. Um, uh, Michelle is in Sydney. Uh, Juliet's in, in uh, Shanghai and Phyllis in Athens. So great to have you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining from all around the world. Uh, appreciate you coming in, um, irrespective of your time zones. Um, we're definitely very keen at Asia has to continue to follow this, this topic and this discussion. Uh, it's clearly something which is really critical for a lot of businesses, both Chinese businesses operating uh, in China and looking at the outside world, um, as well as international companies operating in China. And so it's something that we will look at. If you want to stay in touch, get involved um, and, and tell us uh, your thoughts, please do so. 
uh, as I said earlier, my colleague Johnny is, is able to, to follow up with everything. Um, we'll be in touch with all of you and, and uh, it'd be great to, to see you again on a future discussion and we'll try and um, see where we take this, this topic in our events and, and research more broadly. Um, but really, it just uh, leaves me to say thank you. For, thanks again to our speakers. Thanks to all of you for joining. Um, stay safe and we will see you again very soon. Bye for now. Thank mm -hmm. you.